Thank you all for coming. And um, just to uh, introduce our project, um, it was a rapid uh, grant that we received um, and it focuses on health, housing and hazards, COVID-19 subjective resilience, intersectional vulnerabilities and policy evolution in hurricane prone counties. Um, our grant team was myself um, and Diana Mitsova from Florida Atlantic University and Margaret Esnard from the Andrew Young School of Policy Studies, Georgia State University, uh, Monica Escalaris from Economics at Florida Atlantic and our two PhD students, one from Public Administration and one from um, the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at FAU. Um, so our, our focus in um, our study was basically on looking at multiple hazards and we wanted to look at the impact of COVID-19 in hurricane prone counties and basically how, COVID, how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted the subjective perceptions of resilience of individuals and households who are living in areas that are already still recovering from past hurricanes because prior to COVID, um, Florida suffered, you know, um, hurricanes Irma um, and Michael and, um, you know, and is always vulnerable to more hurricanes as well. So that was one of our first research questions. Our second research question was um, trying to look at, you know, the extent of um, the policies um, and the impact of the policies that were both evolving, fragmented and ambiguous at the federal, state and local level to address COVID-19 and how that affected the coping and adaptive capacities of individuals and households, particularly those that were most vulnerable. So given these two research questions, um, we um, looked at you know, the subjective resilience of, of individuals and households, in particular their adaptive and coping capacities. And adaptive capacity is basically defined as the capacity to learn from an evolving crisis to adjust and modify behavior, while coping capacity deals with the ability of organizations, peoples, and systems to um, adapt uh, to cope with you know available skills and resources um, with um, and manage adverse conditions um, to um, deal and cope with these emergencies that contribute to the reduction of disaster. In looking at that, um, we as we said, focused on vulnerable populations, uh, because as we could see from even the start of the pandemic, minority populations, in particular African-Americans and Latinx populations were disproportionately affected. Um, they had higher age adjusted rates for hospital hospitalization and lived in many of the areas that were hardest hit by the pandemic. Uh, we were also interested in how potential eviction um, and uh, housing issues affected COVID-19 uh, recovery perceptions and uh, looked at in particular over people who were living in overcrowded living environments, who were living in precarious housing situations, people who had to double up, who were, who were facing the threat of eviction and um, you know, how that would affect the ability to comply with pandemic mitigation strategies that basically ask them to shelter in place and um, engage in social distancing and self-quarantining. Um, the other vulnerabilities that we looked at were households with elderly populations, with the young, with, with dis disabled populations, those with limited transportation access, crowded living arrangements, and those with less healthcare system resources. Uh, we also looked at essential workers and the barriers that they faced um, to social distancing and self-quarantining. In addition to that, we were looking at risk perceptions and looking at how direct personal experience uh, with COVID-19, for instance, would affect levels of perceived risk, um, and as well as risk communications from those who they viewed as trusted sources. And you know, uh, research again has shown that this the individual responses to messaging um, with respect to any disaster, and particularly with respect to COVID-19 and, and subsequent policies, um, have varied depending upon the media sources that people rely on, as well as the political persuasions of individuals. With that, um, our research design included um, repeated cross-sectional population surveys. Um, via the internet and landlines, and we had three waves. The first was in July, 2020, the second in November, um, November, 2020, and the third was just completed in April, 2021. The surveys were administered both in English and Spanish. Our, our test area was Florida, as noted earlier, and we combined um, uh, the sampling from and uh, the responses from the online and landline phones um, using propensity score matching. Um, we also weighted our sample um, to reflect um, the, the population and be representative of the population. The initial findings that we have from uh, both the survey one and survey two were basically in terms of, for instance, the ex uh, response to the question whether people had learned to adjust to the disruptions of everyday life caused by the pandemic. Um, we found that, you know, 
obviously by November, there had been some learning going on and people had learned quite a bit, uh, a lot to adjust to the disruptions that had been caused by the pandemic, but they still, you know, had not, did not feel that comfortable. And, you know, in fact, you know, when it comes to the response a great deal, there were fewer in survey two in November who responded positively to that. With respect to our other initial findings, we also found that in terms of coping with financial difficulties, the stimulus checks uh, were more helpful in July. Perhaps by November, you know, we, uh, uh, we we estimate that basically the effect of the stimulus checks were running out, and people were relying more on family members, on food banks, and and nonprofit organizations, as well as a little bit on temporary jobs. Um, to the extent that COVID influenced how socially connected people felt, um, definitely by the, you know, by November, the percentage who felt less connected was much higher. Um, so there was a difference between the first and second surveys with response to that. Um, with regard to um, our um, looking at the um, responses that we got, uh, this is based on just the responses I'm sharing of the first survey right now. Uh, and in response to the question of whether people felt they had recovered or perceptions of recovery, when they felt they would recover from the pandemic, um, the expectations of the length of recovery were positively associated with several factors, such as, you know, the adaptive capacities, those who were better able to adapt thought, you know, recovery would be much faster. Uh, those, however, who, you know, had found that there was much greater risk uh, or more stressed out about um, the pandemic, or who were not prepared, who were worried about the hurricanes, felt recovery would take much longer. Um, any people with health care issues and health insurance issues also uh, felt recovery would take much longer, perceptions of recovery um, expected to be much longer. Um, but in terms of the factors that did help, there were social connections. Again, those who were very connected, uh, we found that was significant in our research that it, they felt the recovery would be much shorter. Those who received assistance from food banks te and temporary jobs um, uh, were also and thought that policies were effective in their areas, also thought that recovery would be much faster. Um, with respect to race and ethnicity, we, we uh, found interestingly that, you know, Hispanic and Latinx populations, even though they were the uh, most badly affected um, in, by the pandemic in a lot of these areas, they were more positive about recovery, and we attribute that to the sort of the Latinx paradox, um, you know, where uh, past research has also found that Latinx populations tend to be more optimistic um, about um, uh, recovery and disasters. Um, we found that trust also matters with respect to news media organizations and family doctors, uh, for instance, people who trusted um, who trusted the sources of information and, and the family doctor, you know, had different perceptions of recovery from those who did not. So um, some of our key contributions um, and applications to this is um, we hope this helps advance knowledge and perceptions of the resilience of individuals and households, particularly when they're faced with multiple hazards, um, such as health risks, the pandemic, from the pandemic and precarious housing conditions and exposure to hazards such as hurricanes. And we hope that this can help improve policies and practices to improve pandemic preparedness and management, and particularly for socially vulnerable populations with respect to housing, sheltering and evacuation in hazard prone areas. Um, one of some of the key points is that we find that, you know, basically the voice of practitioners and policymakers will be critical and there's a need for obviously more coherent policy responses with consistent messaging, messaging that aligns with clearer scientific guidelines. Um, and when we have that, that could lead to better collective cognitions of risk and a more socially cohesive response. So with that, um, I'd just like to um, thank you as well as thank uh, the National Science Foundation for the funding that they provided for this research.